Welcome to Supernatural uh, Fiction. This is um, episode four. We're going to um, uh, speak, uh, first of all, today about things unseen. Our larger themes are um, psychic phenomena, psychological disturbance, dreams, and the uncanny. Again, um, sorry for that mouthful and uh, our many topics for this week, but I'll be dealing with them just in brief right now, and um, there'll be more in the lesson for you. Um, to begin with, uh, M.R. James, once again, possessed the Celtic sense of the unseen, um, exemplified in 1917 when at 2 o'clock in the morning, which is pretty close to the time right now, James heard taps at his window, which may well have been a magnolia outside, and then, for several seconds, an appearance of a curtain being pulled aside from the window again and again. I lighted up at once and watched, but there was no one. I could make nothing of it. Um, that's our start for today. Uh, this is from Elaine Scarry's Dreaming by the Book. We are getting into uh, how the mind processes image, uh, why we see ghosts in a filmy way. Uh, she has a few theories about this. She's a scholar um, of literature, especially in the 19th century novel at Harvard. Um, this is the uh, physiology of the imagination. Why, when the lights go out and storytelling begins, is the most compelling tale, most convincing, most believable, a ghost story? Since most of us have no experience of ghosts in the material world, this should be the tale we least easily believe. The answer is that the story instructs its hearers to create an image whose own properties are second nature to the imagination. It instructs its hearers to depict in the mind something thin, dry, filmy, two-dimensional, and without solidity. Um, her argument is that uh, this is our, our natural way of seeing things in our own mind, um, and then uh, with, a, with a ghost, we transpose uh, that kind of uh, conception um, and project it outside of us. Um, she uses Jane Eyre as an example, and uh, this is from the Red Room at Gateshead. Shaking my hair from my eyes, I lifted my head and tried to look boldly round the dark room. At this moment, a light gleamed on the wall. Was it, I asked myself, a ray from the moon penetrating some aperture in the blind? No, moonlight was still, and this stirred. When I gazed, it glided up to the ceiling and quivered over my head. I can now conjecture readily that this streak of light was, in a likelihood, a gleam from a lantern, carried by someone across the lawn. But then, prepared as my mind was for horror, shaken as my nerves were by agitation, I thought the swift darting beam was a herald of some coming vision from another world. The passing of this luminous, ghostly film over solid walls occurs here again at the moment when the fiction is especially fragile. The story is still in its very early pages. These same two principles are at work in our mental construction of the space in which Flaubert's Charles Bovary first courts Emma Bovary, where a filmy substance, which consists of light, dust, and ash, glimmers, quivers, and drifts across the great stone walls and floors of the farm kitchen. Um, the poet Robert Pinsky observes that Dante's Inferno may be a supreme example of one kind of surface passing over another, one made more solid or opaque by the sliding. He draws attention to Cantos 12, 6 of the Inferno and Canto 21 of the Purg Purgatorio, in which the ability of a physical body to displace material stones or ground is contrasted with the inability of a shade to do so. Hell itself and its inhabitants is one great scrim passing over a more solid reality. Or the reverse, apparent material reality is really a scrim of transparent illusion passing over the more solid moral reality underneath. Uh, something to think about, this kind of criticism is called phenomenology um, and it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, just one last statement from the Dreaming by the Book. Um, their actual motion, uh, this is of ghosts, is incorporated into the motion of fictional persons so that our somatic mimesis, which is imitation of what is happening in the book, works to substantiate and vivify motions on the mental retina that are wholly imaginary. Uh, so it's a kind of theory of how fiction works um, to mimic um, the workings of our minds. On to Freud. Um, more Freud and... Uh, Fittingly, um, our own repetition um, mirrors 
how the uncanny works with returns. Um, I'll start with his conclusion. Our conclusion could then be stated as follows. The uncanny element we know from experience arises either when repressed childhood complexes are revived by some impression or when primitive beliefs that have been surmounted appear to be once again confirmed. Here's uh, the role of repetition. The factor of the repetition of the same thing will perhaps not be acknowledged by everyone as a source of the sense of the uncanny. According to my own observations, it undoubtedly evokes such a feeling under particularly, particular conditions and in combination with particular circumstances, a feeling, moreover, that recalls the helplessness we experience in certain dream states. Um, I think we've all experienced that compulsion um, when we don't want to go through something um, in dreams, and yet um, that's uh, exactly what happens. So against our will, something happens that we can't control. Uh, that kind of um, uh, compelling um, uh, redoing is uh, kind of the core of the uncanny. In the unconscious mind, we can recognize the dominance of a compulsion to repeat, which proceeds from instinctual impulses. The compulsion probably depends on the essential nature of the derives themselves. It is strong enough to override the pleasure principle and lend a demonic character to certain aspects of mental life. And it dominates part of the course taken by the psychoanalysis of victims of neurosis. And so here we are on the mind and diseases of the mind. Anything can remind us of this inner compulsion to repeat is perceived as uncanny. Um, it's actually perceived also as sinister in many illnesses. Um, the analysis of cases of the uncanny has led us back to the old animistic view of the universe, a view characterized by the idea that the world was peopled with human spirits by the narcissistic overrating of one's own mental processes, by the omnipotence of thoughts and techniques of magic that relied on it, by the attribution of carefully graded magical powers called mana to alien persons and things, and by all the inventions with which the unbounded narcissism of that period of development sought to defend itself against the unmistakable sanctions of reality. So this complete irrationality um, where um, we really believe in powers uh, that are in, uh, in control and we are a uh, victim to that. Um, there is more about this in your lesson, but uh, um, how psychoanalytic theory works is in asserting that um, in, when fear is repressed, it follows that among those things that are felt to be frightening, there must be one group in which it can be shown that the frightening element is something that has been repressed and now returns. This species of the frightening, frightening would then constitute the uncanny, and it would be immaterial whether it was itself originally frightening, frightening sorry, or arose from another effect. So it can be so innocuous, these repetitions, um, and yet they become stranger and stranger the more that they happen. The link with repression now illuminates Schelling's definition of the uncanny as something that should have remained hidden and has come out in the open. Um, on um, animism, and this is a great little anecdote that Freud mentions in the, in the Uncanny. This is uh, from some reading that he did during World War I. He said, I, I came across a number of the English Strand magazine. In it, among a number of fairly pointless contributions, <laughs> I read a story about a young couple who move into a furnished flat in which there's a curiously shaped table with crocodiles carved into wood. Towards evening, the flat is regularly pervaded by an unbearable, unbearable and highly characteristic smell. And in the dark, the tenants stumble over things and fancy they see something undefinable gliding over the stairs. In short, one is led to surmise that owing to the presence of this table, the house is haunted by ghostly crocodiles or that the wooden monsters come to life in the dark or something of that sort. It's quite a naive story, but its effect was extraordinarily uncanny. Um, he is talking about um, uh, this uh, furniture um, that the couple um, believes is, um, or it is, resembles amphibians um, and crocodiles specifically. And so they, when they trip on the furniture um, in their new home, uh, they can't help but uh, think something is uh, moving around under their feet. Uh, it's great. 
way to think of um, what troubles us. We are told that it is highly uncanny when inanimate objects, pictures, or dolls come to life. And you'll have more of this next week with Revenants. Um, but there is one story I included for this week um, called The Doll by uh, Joyce Carol Oates. And it has both um, a sort of psychology of um, a disturbed uh, academic and uh, a doll which gets uh, grows larger than life. Um, 